um, and be delighted to welcome Peter Montoro um, and also Rob Turnbull, who has played a part in developing this paper on Should We Feast on the Fragments? An examination of the relative textual stability of lemata and their subsequent repetitions in the course of exposition. And we have 23 pages of handout which have been circulated by email. The handout's also in the chat. So if you don't have the handout, send me a message in the chat button and I will um, send the handout again through chat. But um, in the meanwhile, Peter, over to you. Thank you for presenting this. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. And uh, make sure you have the handout. It's, it's very crucial to the presentation. Uh, and so please make sure that you have that open as it will be referred to frequently throughout the paper. When analyzing patristic citations derived from exegetical works, it's common practice to distinguish between the initial citation of a verse and its fragmented repetitions in the course of a subsequent exposition. On the one hand, it's been claimed by Thea, the Alans, and among many others, that such fragments were less likely to be altered in the course of transmission and are therefore more likely to provide reliable access uh, to the form of the biblical text originally used by the exegete. So from this perspective, it's very appropriate that we should feast on the fragments. We should, we should use them as much as possible uh, because they're much more reliable than the main dishes that have been served in the, the initial citations or the lamata. On the other hand, as Houghton has recently observed, uh, in at least some textual traditions, both the initial citations and their fragmented repetitions can suffer updating or other alteration uh, in the course of transmission. And so that some caution should be exercised uh, in uh, dining on such fragments, as well as the caution that all agree uh, should be exercised in participating in the main course. By comparing the relative textual stability of a number of initial citations with their subsequent repetitions, this paper attempts to test the validity and the value of these observations using the manuscript tradition of Chrysostom's homilies on Romans as a test case. And this is a joint paper between myself and Robert Turnbull. Uh, while I researched and wrote the paper, my work would not have been possible uh, without the help of the software tools uh, that Rob provided for me through his Decodex software suite. A number of them developed specifically for this paper and Python scripts developed specifically for this paper. Uh, so Rob did a lot of work uh, with te technical tools uh, to enable uh, the paper to take place. And Rob is disappointed that he can't be virtually present with us. Uh, but if there's any questions about the tools used in this paper, please feel free to contact him directly using the email provided in the handout. I also want to thank Hugh Houghton, Jeremiah Coogan, Ian Mills, Daniel Stephen, and Elijah Hickson for helpful input and suggestions in the course of developing this paper. When fragments, derivative works, <clears throat> pardon me, and manuscripts that date to the 16th century or later are excluded, 38 manuscripts of the homilies on Romans remain, produced between the 9th and the 15th centuries. Uh, there's also a a substantial fragment dating from the ninth century that's the only majuscule witness. I've taken that into account um, where it is present. That leads to a total of 39 witnesses in the handouts. Uh, as part of my larger project, I have obtained an image, uh, obtained an index, full image sets of all of these manuscripts, and a full listing has been provided at the end of the handout. Now, in order to compare the relative textual stability of initial citations, and their subsequent repetition. So we're trying to, 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 to assess the, the relative reliability of, of these two different entities, of the main dish and of the fragments that follow. So in order to compare uh, the relative textual stability of initial citations and subsequent fragmented repetitions, I searched for examples where the initial citation contained a variation unit that was cited at least two times, two additional times, in the remainder of the homilies on Romans. So a, a place where the, a particular fragment was repeated at least twice more. By focusing exclusively on variation units that are repeated three or more times, we'll be enabled to directly consider the relative textual stability of initial citations and their subsequent repetitions. In addition, the nine examples we'll consider demonstrate some surprising tendencies with regard to the Byzantine text that were a surprise to me as I'm sure they will be to many of you as well. 
For each of these examples as provided in the handout, the full verse from which it's taken in the form found in both the NA28 and the Robinson Pierpont edition, which frequently serves as a stand-in for the Byzantine text, the context of each citation in the homilies on Romans taken from Minya's edition, and a, most importantly, a color-coded correlation of the full extant evidence for each variation unit. So our first example is taken from Romans 2.14. And in this verse, the RP text, the Robinson Pierpont text, which I'll refer to as RP, has the present subjunctive third person singular reading PE, and the NA28 text has the present subjunctive third person plural piosin. Other manuscripts of Romans read PE, the third person singular indicative, and piosin, the third person plural indicative. In his homilies on Romans, Chrysostom cites the portion of the verse that contains this variant four times, uh, three times in the course of exegesis in homily five, as well as an additional quotation in homily six. As shown in the handout in the text of Minya, all of these quotations are identical and all of them match the wording of the Byzantine text. So the fragments and the main dish, they all match. They all give the same form of the text. They're consistent. Since the easily made change between subjunctive and indicative forms uh, likely took place multiple times, uh, both in the manuscript tradition of Romans uh, and in that of uh, Minya as well, the key difference here is between the dissimilar singular and plural form. So between the third person plural and third person singular, um, that's the key distinction. So in the collation provided, shades of green indicate support for the third person singular, and uh, shades of red indicate support for the third person plural, uh, whether subjunctive or indicative in either case. And this example supports the principle that longer citations, especially those in the course of exegesis, are more likely to be altered than shorter citations especially in locations substantially removed from the exegesis of a particular verse in its context. In the first location in which the verse has been cited in full, five manuscripts offer a third person plural reading. In the second location, which cites a much briefer portion of the verse, only one manuscript offers a third person plural reading. In the third location in which the verse is cited in full again, once again, five manuscripts, the same five manuscripts as in the first citation, offer a third person plural reading. Most strikingly of all, in the secondary quotation in homily six, while one manuscript somewhat bizarrely has a second person plural, no manuscripts offer a third person plural. In this example, we notice two tendencies. At least in some in instances, longer citations were indeed more likely to be changed than shorter citations. Second, while it has often been taken almost as an axiom, that the direction of textual updating is always going to be from a non-Byzantine reading to a Byzantine reading, uh, the reverse is also possible. Given the pattern of variation that's found here, if you look at the chart on the handout, it seems most likely that the initial text or the, the, the original text of Chrysostom's homilies on Romans had third person singular forms across the board and the third person plural forms found in some manuscripts and the third person plural is the reading found in the NA28. Um, are a secondary correction away from a reading that originally was Byzantine. In our second variation unit found in Romans 226, the NA28 and RP text agree with only minor orthographical variation. However, at least one New Testament manuscript, Minuscule 104, uh, does in fact have Metatrapisitep in this location. In Minya, the initial citation of this verse has replaced the word Logothesitep, will be reckoned or counted with peri trapicite, will be changed or turned. In the second impartial citation, Minya has metatrapicite, and the third citation of this variation unit explicitly comments on its wording. So in the text of Minya, this comment reads as follows, ke ugipe, logothesite, ala trapicite, opera which translates, and he did not say it will be regarded, but it will be changed, which was more emphatic leaving aside the differences between the prefix preposition, whether parity or meta or no preposition at all, the core variation here is the difference between logothesite and various forms of trepo. 36 of the 39 manuscripts of the homilies on Romans consulted provide evidence for these three locations. In the initial citation, no less than 17 of these manuscripts, or almost exactly half, have logothesite 
as found in nearly all manuscripts of Romans at this point. Uh, when we come to the second and third repetitions found in the context of an explicit comment on the wording of this variation unit, we find that only five of these 17 manuscripts have Logothesotep. And these five manuscripts have reversed the direction of Chrysostom's comment. Rather than saying, Ke ukipa logothesite a la trapisite oper enthetikotran in, they instead say, Ke, ke ukipen metatrapisite a la logothesite oper enthetikotran in, a statement which makes very little sense. So I spoke to someone who has a much better sense of the, the various weighting of these words in Greek, and he said it doesn't make sense that anyone would ever say that logothesite is more emphatic than metatrapisite. Uh, this reversal can only be explained by an attempt to update the text uh, without taking the exegesis into account. If this were the only place where this change occurred, one might suspect a simple transposition. But this is ruled out by the fact that these same five manuscripts have substituted Logothesite for the various forms of trepo in two previous instances, and that renders an accidental explanation here unlikely. Uh, these are the same five manuscripts that had the non-Byzantine third-person plural reading in the example taken from 2.14, providing further support to the tentative conclusion that these manuscripts are the result of an intentional revision of the biblical text. As an additional point of interest, the first hand of 13 manuscripts instead of the three different forms of trepo found in Minya have conformed all three locations to the single form metatapisite. And when corrections are taken into account, a 14th manuscript can be added to this category. Based on this pattern of variation, we can draw a few preliminary conclusions. Uh, number one, it seems to be significantly more likely that the homilies on Romans initially contained a mix of various forms of trepo and that the use of logothesite is the result of editorial work or scribal updates. And once again, it appears that longer citations are more likely to be changed uh, than shorter repetitions in the course of exegesis. But at the same time, there is striking evidence of a clear intention, whether on the part of scribes or editors or whatever you want to call whoever is doing this work, to seek textual consistency, even among the fragments, even if it meant editing the to say the opposite of what they originally said. Given this tendency, given the fact that we know that this takes place in exegetical works, that there is a desire, not always perfectly realized, but there's a clear, there's evidence of a clear desire to make all the fragments mash the initial dish um, in that case, we'll not be able to tell the difference between an originally consistent citation and one that's been made so by later editing without a thorough analysis of the entire manuscript tradition of a work. We now move on to our third example, which is taken from Romans 4.2. Once again, the NA28 and RP text of this verse are identical, except for a single variant the presence or absence of the article in the last phrase of the verse. The NA28 text has prostheon, and the RP text has prostontheon. Though this difference is minor, a full collation, pardon me, of the evidence for this variation unit provides important insight into the questions that we're attempting to address in this paper. In the Romans homilies, this particular variation unit is cited no less than six times five times throughout homily eight and once in homily 16. Now in the text of Minya, we find the RP text prostontheon in each of these instances, as we do in the overwhelming majority of manuscripts of the homilies on Romans. Rather astonishingly, however, there is a single manuscript, Saba 20, which has the NA28 text form without the article in all six of these instances. Well, many features of this variation, uh, two additional manuscripts have the form without the article only in the sixth and final instance found in homily 16. While many features of this variation unit are rather puzzling, what is perhaps most significant is just how thorough the scribes or editors who sought to update the textual forms found in these homilies could at least on occasion be. They weren't always that successful, but they could be astonishingly thorough. While many alterations could easily be the result of a purely accidental substitution of the text being copied with the mental text of the scribe, it seems implausible that the sort of variation we see here uh, could be accounted for by anything but intentional and indeed painstaking editorial efforts at some point along the way. 
As a preliminary confirmation of this conclusion, in the 7,000 or so words of test passages that I have transcribed, there are 67 uses of the form of the article Tong in Minya's text. Of these 67 uses, these six examples are the only places where Saba 20 omits this form of the article. This makes an explanation based on copying uh, tendencies rather unlikely uh, and provides additional evidence that the pattern seen in the chart is the result of deliberate textual correction, in this case, away from the Byzantine form of the text, which again was very surprising to me and uh, different from what I had previously thought was taking place here. Our next variation unit is found in Romans 415. The RP has Ugaru Gestin Nomos, and the NA28 has Ude Ugestin Nomos. The homilies on Romans cite this variation unit three times, twice in homily eight and once in homily 12, with the second and third citations uh, being somewhat briefer than the first. In Minya and in the majority of manuscripts, all three of these citations have the gar that is found in RP. In the first citation, however, eight manuscripts have the de that is found in the NA28. The second and third citations, however, have gar in all extant manuscripts. This data suggests the following points. As we have seen before, the longer initial citation does indeed seem more likely to be altered than subsequent fragmented repetitions. Given the consistency of the second and third citation in reading gar in the entirety of the manuscript edition, it seems more likely that the initial reading in the first location was gar than that the second and third citation have been changed from de to gar in the entirety of the extant manuscript tradition. Once again, it therefore appears as if the text has been changed away from a Byzantine reading toward the reading found in the NA 28. Our next variation unit is found in Romans 5.1. The variation here is the difference between echomen, subjunctive with an omega, and echomen indicative with an omicron. The Byzantine text is split here. The context of Chrysostom's exegesis makes it clear that he interprets a reading echomen as an exhortation rather than a statement of fact, uh, providing strong support for the subjunctive. In the homilies on Romans, this word is cited three times, while Menya's text has the subjunctive reading in all three locations. Uh, there is, as one would expect, variation in the manuscript tradition. In the first citation, eight of the 34 manuscripts extant at this location have the indicative reading, and one additional manuscript has been corrected to this reading for a total of nine. In the second citation, which is, can be seen from the handout immediately follow, seven manuscripts have the indicative. And in the third citation, five manuscripts have the indicative. As one can see by looking at the chart, there is no manuscript that has the indicative reading in the repetitions that does not also have the indicative reading in the first citation. In other words, we are not looking at a purely random pattern here. Uh, what we are seeing instead is a tendency to correct the subjunctive reading to the indicative reading, uh, even though this contradicts the exegesis itself. If you read what Chrysostom is saying, there's no way it fits with an indicative reading. He's taking it as an exhortation. While the intention seems to be to make this change consistently, the farther one gets away from the initial citation, the colder the fragments get, as it were, the more likely the corrector is to miss one of the repetitions. Uh, at the same time, there are five manuscripts that do correct all three repetitions. Uh, once again, we see the same tension that we have observed before. While there's a tendency for later fragments to be left unaltered, that is a tendency that there is evidence for that. There's also a serious attempt on the part of editors and or scribes to alter even the smallest and most distant of fragments to match the form of the text uh, that they, for whatever reason, deem authoritative. Until the entirety of the manuscript tradition is examined, for a particular variation unit, uh, it is impossible to see which of these two conflicting tendencies is at work uh, in a given instance. Our sixth example comes from Romans 8.2. The variation here is between Eleftheros and Set in the NA28 text and Eleftheros and Me in the RP text. This uh, variation unit occurs three times in the homilies on Romans. In the Minya text, all three of the locations read meth, and indeed Chrysostom is cited in support of this reading in the UBS apparatus. The first hand of only 10 of the 36 witnesses extant in these locations has meth in all three locations. Before correction, 16 manuscripts consistently have set. 
Based on the number of corrections, it seems likely that this change was made many times with a clear tendency to correct se to me. Given the fact that all three citations are similar in length, it's not surprising that all three of them are subject to similar amounts of variation. Once again, we see on the one hand, clear evidence for deliberate attempts to update citations across the board. This was viewed as a desirable thing to do. People kept trying to do it. And on the other hand, equally clear evidence that this was not always as successful as those attempting it might have hoped. In this particular example, there is so much variation and it's such an easy change to make uh, that it's impossible to determine which tendency is predominant without an understanding of the direction of textual flow based on clear examples. So here's an example where you would need a stemma based on clear examples uh, in order to even evaluate uh, the evidence. Our next example is taken from Romans 11.3. In the third clause of this verse, the NA28 reads, epektinon ta thesiasteria, and the RP text reads, epektinon ke ta thesiasteria. And this clause is cited four times in the homilies on Romans, and the variation here is the addition of a ke. Now, the first time cites the verse as a whole, word for word, in agreement with the NA28 text. Uh, the second time cites the first half of the verse, this time with the extra ke found in the RP text, but otherwise exactly the same uh, in wording as the first. The third citation once again quotes the verse as a whole in the RP form, with the sole additional change being the substitution of ke ego for kago, a change that, while not our focus here, is also found in manuscripts of Romans. The fourth citation, briefer and worded somewhat more loosely in other respects, contains our variation unit in the Byzantine form. Turning now to our collation alignment, once again, we see that the longer citations found in the first and third instances have a great deal of variation, while the shorter citations found in the second and fourth citations have very little variation. While seven manuscripts have the RP reading in all four locations, no manuscript, no manuscripts have the NA28 reading across the board. While it is difficult to determine the direction of textual change here, both principles are once again in evidence. On the one hand, the longer and more precise citations uh, tend to be the subject of more variation. Uh, while on the other hand, there are consistent attempts uh, to make every last citation match, underscoring the need to consider the entirety of a manuscript tradition before drawing conclusions about the evidence of any citation, no matter how frequently repeated in the course of exegesis. Our eighth example is found in Romans 15.5. Though both the NA28 and RP text agree in reading Christon Yisun at the conclusion of this verse, uh, some manuscripts of Romans have the reading Yisun Christu, so the order of the words is reversed. And this variation unit is cited three times in the homilies on Romans. The first two citations cite the verse in full, while the third cites only the last clause, which contains the variation unit. While the third, first example has Yisun Christu in five witnesses, and the second has it in eight, the last and shortest example, which only cites the final three words, has this reading in nine. Now, if the patterns we have observed in previous examples hold true, it would seem that the simplest explanation uh, of what we see here is that it's the result of a multi-stage process. So at an earlier point in the tradition, the ancestors of some of the manuscripts that now read Yisun Christon only in the repetitions also had them in the initial citations. Uh, these were then subject to an intentional change that did not reach uh, the secondary repetitions. If the stomatic evidence from clearer instances shows that this is not likely, uh, then this example would show that the general principles that we have based on the clearer examples have some exceptions, which every rule has exceptions, so that wouldn't be surprising. We come now to Romans 16.2, our final example uh, in this paper. In the NA28, the last two words of this verse read, emu octu. In the RP, the order of these words has been reversed, uh, giving the reading octu emu. This variation unit occurs five times in the homilies on Romans, uh, four times in homily 30, and once in homily 31. The initial citation contains the whole of the second half of the verse, exactly as it is found in the RP text. The second and third repetitions contain only the clause, ke to emu. The fourth and fifth repetitions are identical, containing most of the second half of the verse with the initial pronoun flattened to fit the context. In the Minya text, all five of these citations have off to and move. 
18 of the 33 manuscripts uh, extant at this location have the order up to Emu, as in Minya. As our pattern would expect, we find the most amount of variation in the first citation, uh, with uh, eight manuscripts reading off uh, in the first citation, with eight manuscripts reading Emu off to. While no manuscript has Emu off to in all five locations, two have it in all four locations in homily 30 in the first hand and one more after correction. Significantly, only two manuscripts read Emu off to in the secondary quotation in homily 31. As neither of these manuscripts have this reading in any of the four citations in homily 30, and as they are otherwise so closely related as to make it likely that one is a copy of the other, it seems plausible to posit that this is an independent scribal error rather than an attempt at textual updating. If this is the case, then it once again uh, seems more probable that Octu Amu, the Byzantine reading, was the reading of the archetype of the extant manuscript edition of Chrysostom's homilies on Romans, with the reading in Muach II being an attempt at textual updating carried out more or less consistently. So I will conclude with two points that summarize the data we have observed. First, while there are exceptions, the evidence presented, examined, suggests that the general tendency is indeed for longer initial citations to be more susceptible to alteration uh, than the subsequent and shorter citation fragments that follow. So it is indeed the case that there is a greater tendency uh, for the main dish to be tampered with uh, than for the fragments to be altered. So that is true. This tendency is much more pronounced when the difference is between a recitation in the course of exegesis and a requotation in a subsequent homily. So the farther away you get from the main dish, the more likely it is uh, that a fragment has been left unaltered and thus can be feasted upon. However, working against this general tendency is a clear desire on the part of at least some revisers, revisers to achieve consistency on even the smallest of textual details in even the briefest of textual fragments, going so far as to alter six widely separated instances of a single article that does not even affect the sense. Without a thorough examination of the textual tradition as a whole, therefore, it is impossible to determine which of these two tendencies in tension are predominant in a particular variation unit, and we should therefore use caution in feasting on the fragments until we've got a sense of the whole picture. Second, on a more surprising note, it seems as though there are a number of passages where the Byzantine reading has been changed, whether consistently or inconsistently, to a reading which agrees with the NA28. And this challenges the general tendency to assume that simply because a reading has de been determined to, on other grounds, to be the initial text of the New Testament, uh, that it must also be the initial text of patristic works on the New Testament. Um, and, and that, in fact, does not appear to be the case. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. And I see applause in lots of little windows um, all over the world. Thank you also for the handout showing us in colour all of the differences that we can spot which scribes couldn't. There's plenty for us to feast on here. I think in the interests of time, um, we'll only have one or two questions at this point and continue a sort of greater discussion um, after the second paper. So if you want to be one of those two questioners now, please put up your hand or type in the chat box um, and with your question. Joey has Joey has leapt in with the first question. So over to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for that talk, Peter. Um, so uh, I noticed looking at the uh, at the collation tables that we do see a lot of, I guess a lot of like highlighted uh, you know, apparent changes in like the first columns and then they seem to taper off after that in, in many cases. Um, assuming that these uh, patristic works were actually, they occurred in these orders in the manuscripts. Would you say that there's a, this is some indication of like sort of editorial fatigue on the part of the scribes? Yeah, who are so, so, to that, so it? yeah, so in every, so th that's exactly what I'm saying. So in every, in every case, right, the initial citation, that initial citation is, is the longer one and the ones that follow are the fragments. <laughs> And okay. so, and so that's exactly the pattern you're, you're seeing exactly the, so that there is 
there is that tendency to a, a whole verse being cited is easier to catch than a single clause. But there are clear examples of people catching every single clause, like a two or three word clause and changing every single one. Um, so there's this, this uh, you know, so, so on the one hand, it is true there is editorial fatigue, but there are some very indefatigable editors um, that are out there in the transmission of patristic citations. Thank you. You're not easily fatigued. They, they, they found coffee early or something like that. And they're, they're at it. Thank you. And it is really fascinating to see this data ahead of us, given that we're so used to patristic text having a very limited apparatus that to have this level of information about the manuscripts is wonderful. Would anybody like to ask anything else at this point? Oh, Dora, yes? Second question over to you. Hello, thank you, Peter, for your paper. Um, regarding an example that uh, you have given about the uh, Echomen in um, Romans 5.1, whether is it, it is indicative or uh, subjunctive. Mm -hmm. um, if we consider that uh, this is a sermon, and uh, it is uh, an oral speech in front of the audience, and um, it has uh, preceded um, a lot of use of subjunctive. Um, perhaps this influences also the um, biblical text that uh, he cites in his work. Yeah, so, you know, so I think with Chrysostom, Chrysostom everything he says is in a subjunctive exhortative mood, pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. So even if Chrysostom had a manuscript that was indicative, uh, he would have potentially been tempted to make it subjunctive because he, he tends to do that with just about everything. Uh, but the comments that I'm making aren't about, you know, the initial. So the question of how you get from, from his oral homily to a written manuscript, I think that's a separate question. But the question I'm trying to address here is what are scribes doing with the transmission of this text as commentary, um, as opposed to you know initially that that initial process, I think that would be that would be very that's certainly a valid observation, and, and I agree with it on what Chrysostom is doing. But when we're looking at what scribes are doing, we we are seeing a, a clear tendency in that particular one where it, you know the context makes it clear he's you know so even though the words would sound the same, if you're listening to this sermon, if you're reading it even in translation. It's, it's obvious that he is taking this as a subjunctive. He's taking this as an exhortation, not as a statement of, of fact. He's saying, let us, because it goes on subjunctive after subjunctive after subjunctive. Uh, and, and, you know, for a couple of paragraphs on this. But despite all of that, you have scribes selectively having, you know, corrections from the subjunctive to the indicative because, you know, correcting it. And, and, and the only reason that would make sense wouldn't be a homily reason, but it would be a, a matching to manuscripts of the New Testament reason. Yeah. Because as you say, there's nothing, there's nothing in the context that would say, ah, this is out of place as a subjunctive. We need to make it indicative. That would only be by comparing it to New Testament manuscripts without necessarily paying much attention to the context of what he's doing in his homily itself. Super. Thank you. So we'll postpone any further discussion, but there's plenty to discuss until um, after the, um, the end of this session. And 